Uh, many thanks for coming today, uh, joining us in our, our look at the media environment uh, in Tibet. I'm Bruce Sherman, Director of Strategy and Development at the Broadcasting Board of Governors. I'll be the moderator for today's discussion. I'm joined by Betsy Henderson, who's the Radio Free Asia Research Director, by Bill Bell, who's the Voice of America Research Director, and by uh, Rajesh, uh, Saran, Saran, pronounce your name for me again, Rajesh? Srinivasan. Srinivasan. There you go, Srinivasan, Regional Director for the Gallup World Poll in Asia and Program Director for our BBG uh, project. Uh, my office oversees our global research program, a program that we began more than 10 years ago, and now with Gallup, continue with Gallup as our new partner and our research provider. Uh, BBG and Gallup share a passion and a commitment, and that is that we are seeking to know what's on people's minds all over the world. And in our case, we're seeking to know how people use media. BBG, uh, uh, at, at the BBG, we have a, a firm conviction that we can't reach audiences that we don't understand. And research is therefore critical to fulfilling our mission of encouraging free, open, democratic societies through free press and free expression. In fact, our mission, our research rather, is so uh, important that Congress has mandated that we undertake a robust research program and have a reliable research capacity. Uh, our subtitle for today's presentation captures an especially salient difference about uh, Tibet. Uh, around the world today, uh, it's of course true that when you look at global media trends, cell phone use uh, is uh, uh, extraordinarily high. Social media have exploded. Uh, television remains <clears throat> dominant. Satellite television is growing, of course, by leaps and bounds. But it's also true that every country is different. And the dedication we have at the BBG and in our partnership with Gallup is in understanding what the nuances are by country. And with respect to Tibet, the notion that word of mouth exchange of news and information plays such an important role distinguishes Tibet uh, in many respects from many other countries. Not that word of mouth is not important in other places, but it's especially important in Tibet, and therefore we've, we've sought to highlight that, uh, that issue in our presentation as it's come out very strong in our research over many years, including the most recent research. So here's the order of things for today. Betsy will, will lead us off with a presentation uh, that looks at Tibet research over many years to provide context for the most recent findings from the BBG Gallup research. Rajesh will walk us through high points of those findings, and then Bill will come in with, with additional uh, analysis. Then we'll turn to your questions and, and to the discussion. We're aiming for about a 50-50 split in terms of time we spend talking and time we spend in questions and discussion. Uh, Tibet, obviously, is a very rich topic. We could talk about all kinds of things related to Tibet, but we're focused here today on the media environment in Tibet, and so we'll encourage particularly your questions and discussion on, on, those, on those topics. Um, one thing that I would uh, also like to highlight, uh, and that is that this series uh, represents the BBG and Gallup's commitment to being as transparent as possible about the research that we do. Uh, we are uh, funded, of course, by the U.S. taxpayers. Uh, we believe it is important to share information to the extent that, that we can with uh, citizens of the country, uh, particularly very interested parties in the different places around the world that we at BBG target, like Tibet. In other words, you. We're very interested that you're here. We're grateful that you've come. We want to share this information with you. At the same time, we're mindful, of course, that we do research in uh, politically sensitive and difficult to access places, Tibet being one of those. Therefore, there are limits uh, to the extent to which we can speak about certain research methods and sources. Uh, but to the extent we can, we will be transparent with you about how we've done the research and, of course, about, about what we have found. So with all that, let's dive in. Betsy. Well, I'm going to start out, as uh, Bruce said, looking at um, research we've done over the last... Um, actually the last 12 years, but I'm going to focus in on the t last 10 years. Um, RFA uh, started its research efforts in, uh, in 1998, uh, a couple years after the broadcast had been on the air. And uh, we got right into it looking into Tibet. Um, but today I'm going to focus on uh, the 10 annual surveys that we've done with uh, refugees and travelers. 
um, informed by dozens of qualitative projects that we've done over the years as well. Um, all, these have all been conducted outside Tibet, but they're rather comprehensive surveys of recent refugees and travelers who are over the age of 15, age 15 and over. Um, of course, they're not representative of Tibetans in Tibet, and as you'll see in a few slides, the demographics are unusual, um, and they vary year to year with the size of the group um, and the outflow from Tibet. Okay, let's first start out very quickly for those who are less familiar with Tibet. Um, most folks who think about Tibet think it is the Tibet Autonomous Region. As the Encyclopedia Britannica shows you here on this map, um, many, of, many maps will simply say Tibet. Um, however, um, there are additional Tibet Autonomous Prefectures and counties outside of the Tibet Autonomous Region in Qinghai province, Sichuan province, and Gansu province. And actually, half the population of Tibetans living under Chinese rule live outside of the TAR. Um, in traditional Tibetan uh, way of looking at it, uh, there are three traditional regions of Tibet, Utsang, which is entirely in the Tibet Autonomous Region, Kham, which is in the Tibet Autonomous Region, then Sichuan and a little bit in Gansu, and then in Amdo, mostly in Qinghai province. This is significant because many of the activities that have been going on over the last few years are not in the TAR at all. Um, as this um, RFA Tibet self-immolation map shows, there's been a concentration in the self-immolations outside of the TAR. It also is significant because the groups that we've reached over the last decade are disproportionately from the Kham region. Now, you can see um, disproportionately from the Kham region, very fewer from Utsang. Um, uh, demographic data from Tibet are very hard to come by, but our best um, understanding is that the populations are roughly equal between the three um, regions. Okay, I'm going to take a closer look at the most recent, um, the most recent group, and um, that's 13, more than 1,300 refugees. Not surprisingly, the group tends to favor people who have the will and the ability to leave Tibet, and they tend to be younger, and they tend to be male. Um, looking at the village, the urban-rural split, and the education, actually, our knowledge of Tibet suggests it's not that much different than the underlying population. Um, and these, uh, these um, demographic features of the groups have been fairly consistent over the last 10 years. Um, this group was actually somewhat older. Um, also fairly consistent over the last uh, 10 years is the fact that a significant portion of these people are mon monks, nuns, or lamas. This group was a third uh, monastic, and that is fairly typical. Also, although in the years immediately following the uprisings in Tibet in 2008, we had a drop off to about 20% for a couple of years. Okay, so not representative of Tibet, a very unusual group, and also a group highly motivated um, to leave for, what, for various reasons. Um, so let's take a quick look at the traditional media inside Tibet. One thing that's clear is that regular television use is growing. And this is not actually something that should be surprising because uh, the Chinese have made a significant effort to reach out to Tibetans, uh, especially since the mid-2000s. Um, in 2006, they launched um, 17 and a half hours of programming streams in Qinghai People's Broadcasting Station in Amdo dialect. So they're not only reaching out in standard Tibetan language, they're reaching out in the Amdo dialect. And more recently, they've started broadcasts in the Kham dialect in their Sichuan People's Radio Station. So these programs, uh, the cultural programs and the entertainment programming is extremely popular with Tibetans as reflected in this um, survey. Um, 
some regional variation. Okay, what uh, other additional ways of getting information include um, use of satellite dishes and U.S. broadcasts um, are broadcast not only the television broadcasts of the VOA Kunlung Tibetan Television, but also uh, Radio Free Asia and Voice of America radio are rebroadcasts on satellite. So we've been uh, very interested in this. Um, I know that some in the room will be familiar with um, the Wooser blog picture, uh, the Tibetan blogger who had photographs of satellite dishes smashed on the ground outside of a um, monastery. And we certainly have heard a lot of information about removal of satellite dishes over the years as something that has been designed to limit the impact of um, international broadcasts. What we see here, though, is a growth in the number of satellite dishes. Taking a closer look, it's clear that this is not a uniform phenomenon, and that Utsang, which is, of course, the, wholly inside of the Tibet Autonomous Region, has significantly fewer satellite dishes. And um, traditionally, the control of media within the TAR has been much, much tighter than um, outside the TAR. And this is reflected in satellite ownership. Uh, AMDO has had the highest penetration. OK, moving on. However, um, when you take a closer look at uh, the, the size of the satellite dish, you don't see quite as clear a picture. Um, you see that the number of the percentage of large dishes, you know, again, year to year, you're not seeing any trend lines in this presentation because the, the data are not directly comparable year to year. However, you do see something that's fairly indicative of a reduction in the percentage of small satellite dishes. And this is significant because the small satellite dishes have much more difficulty receiving foreign broadcasts. And you see this in all three regions. Um, but because the impact has traditionally been highest in common AMDO, you, it's noteworthy that it is happening there as well. OK, a look at new media inside Tibet. Um, you know, you don't see, considering this is a younger group, um, it's not a very high internet usage. Um, regular use is use on a weekly basis. Um, and it doesn't seem to be sort of taking off in any way. But in contrast to that, mobile phones really are taking off. And this is an area that we looked at in more detail um, in Bodhgaya research that was done by um, Gallup. And they'll be talking a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, one thing we see is that just like satellite dishes uh, were highest in the AMDO region, also internet use and regular mobile phone use were higher, much higher in AMDO than in Utsang and Kham. One limiting factor for the use of new media is Chinese uh, language ability. Um, among our group, there about 50 to 60 percent said they had some ability to understand um, Chinese. However, if you asked, can you understand a broadcast, um, even in the highest group, which was from Amdo, only 8 percent said they could understand a broadcast in Chinese. And literacy was even lower. So it's a real limiting factor on use of the internet, which is primarily in Chinese. Uh, you can see Tibetan. Uh, internet use is a little a little more um, out there because there are materials in Tibetan. Um, it is a limiting factor also on the use of text messaging, which is the green bar. Um, what you have there is the percentage of people using text messaging who use each language. Um, what we found is the equipment and the networks don't facilitate uh, the use of Tibetan. So Tibetans are more likely to use um, multimedia type things than texting. Um, around f less than 5% of the users um, of that small group of people who use the internet had used any kind of circumvention technique to get around the Great Firewall. 
Okay, so what does any of this have to do with information in Tibet, all these media access, media use? Actually, surprisingly little on first glance. And um, in spite of the fact that you've had a massive uptick in foreign television uh, availability in various languages, you don't see it at coming up as a source of information for people. Um, this is the response to the question, you know, what's, what's your top source for reliable news and information? And it's completely unprompted. So unprompted, almost everybody's going to say, oh, I get it from Joe, or, well, not Joe, but uh, Tenzing. Um, so um, another thing that's important uh, to, to know is that our survey also reveals a very, very high level of distrust for the stations, even among people who consume their product. So, for example, um, Tibet, public broad, uh, Tibet People's Broadcasting Service has a very high audience, but 72% of their annual audience says their news is either untrust, somewhat untrustworthy or very untrustworthy. And another 18% say that it, they're just not sure whether it's trustworthy or not. So you have almost nobody who thinks their news is trustworthy. Same for Qinghai People's Broadcasting Service and Lhasa People's Broadcasting Service, 74% untrustworthy, 14% not sure. Um, another top source uh, is none. <laughs> they don't have people, they don't have anything. Uh, moving right along though, you see foreign radio and international TV. Now, Foreign radio and international TV really is U.S. broadcasting. There is not a lot of broadcasting in Tibetan. Uh, the BBC does not broadcast in Tibetan, um, and other major um, broadcasters do not broadcast in Tibetan. Uh, All India Radio does some broadcast in Tibetan. There is the Voice of Tibet, which is based in Europe, but their audiences are not very large. So it really is Voice of America and Radio Free Asia. Um, and you see, as Bruce had said earlier, that we see the, we've seen this for many, many years. Um, I remember writing the questionnaires early on, early on and saying, OK, well, let's ask them what their top sources are. You know, what are their top TV stations, radio stations, newspapers, whatever? And in 2003, we asked that question, and 77% said none. So then we realized that we were missing something important. and. Uh, started to ask, what are your top sources, and um, encourage people to name people as well. So um, there's some marginal regional variation in this. Um, if you combine word of mouth with people who say none, you see that um, folks in Amdo, even though they are highly reliant on word of mouth, um, are somewhat less reliant on somewhat less in the dark, perhaps, than people in calm, certainly. OK, this, this slide um, is talking about the non-word-of-mouth sources. And what I wanted to highlight here was that you, you'll recall the satellite access was significantly lower in Utsang. And you'll see that the international TV as a top source not surprisingly, is quite low in Utsang and much, much higher in Amdo. Um, and you'll see what, what that means is that in, in Lhasa and in, uh, in the Tibet Autonomous Region, radio continues to be extraordinarily important to people as a source of news and information. OK, and this is much, much more clear when you break it down by when you break the sample into those who have used foreign broadcasts versus those who haven't. And you'll see that among people who don't use US broadcasts, essentially, they're really limited to 89% word of mouth, 8% none. And they're still not going to domestic television for, for news and information. They don't consider it reliable. In contrast, among the foreign radio audience, you have 67% unprompted who will say, yes, that's my top source of news. 
Similarly, for international TV, among the inter those people who are fortunate enough to get the VOA uh, Kunlung Tibetan Television, 66% say it's their top source of news and information. And that's really um, consistent with what we've seen in the qualitative work. We see people who are highly motivated to receive this information. Um, if there's jamming in the city, they talk about taking their bicycles out to the, to the mountains to listen and come back and tell their friends about what they heard on VOA and RFA radio. If um, you know their satellite has been smashed, they're going to go to someone who has a satellite that can receive it. So it really is um, a highly motivated group, and it may sound a little self-serving, but I want to read a couple of quotes that um, are from people who, that really are things that we have heard year after year after year. Um, here's one about VOA. I find v Voice of America important because if there's anything that unites all Tibetans inside and outside Tibet, it is firstly His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and secondly, Voice of America. And here's another one about RFA, which is, again, the, the Tibetans tend to have a very poetic way of talking. If there is no Radio Free Asia, then it is like there is no light in the house. So as we started our relationship with Gallup, and um, we realized that the, we had an incredible opportunity uh, by in the Kala Chakra teachings that were scheduled uh, for late December, early January of this year. And um, the reason it's an extraordinary opportunity is the Kala Chakra initiation is, an, is a critical rite for Tibetan Buddhists. And the Dalai Lama has only done 33 Kala Chakra teachings since 1954. Um, it was the first in India since 2006 and the first in Bogaya since 2003. It had between 300,000 and 500,000 participants and at least 2,000 who had come directly from Tibet. So we thought, very exciting to d delve more into the dynamics of word of mouth, how is information <coughs> shared, who shares, what role does new media play in this, and get more into how word of mouth dynamics have played out in recent events, including the horrible rash of self-immolations and um, the exiled government elections, which I believe Bill is going to be presenting in a little bit as well. So I'll turn it over to Rajesh. Uh, we had the opportunity to go in a few days before the teaching started um, to conduct our uh, work. And uh, by definition, the people who were coming and attending the teachings uh, had worked very hard to try and make it to this place. I'm told that uh, several thousand people had applied permission to be able to come and attend. And uh, the counts are uh, very difficult to you know, uh, say, but around 2,000 to 3,000 folks from Tibet actually finally made it to the teachings. So clearly, it's a very unique kind of group uh, and non-projectable from that sense. So all uh, insights that are coming from this have to be taken uh, as more indicative rather than uh, really defining something specific as far as the population is concerned. Uh, the the uh, respondents came from all three parts of uh, Tibet, Andokam and Unsung, and we were very much interested in uh, focusing on a specific subgroup of the population, which is young folks, 20 to 50 year olds, with heavy media use, uh, essentially you know, heavy mobile phone use. Uh, that was the criteria that we had used, and clearly an indication that they were returning back to uh, Tibet. Uh, we had two components to this research. One was a quantitative uh, study, and the other one was a qualitative. And the quantitative, as you can see, uh, it's a fairly small sample size, about 117. Uh, but just so you know, it is a, a very different environment to be doing research, so it is impossible for us to be doing large-scale studies at this point. Uh, they are a captive audience for a very short period of time. They have several other things going on uh, during the day uh, and in the evening, so it was uh, a fairly limited and focused exercise. The objectives, um, as Betsy pointed out, was, of course, to understand more about the word of mouth dynamics, uh, you know, information nodes, who are the key information sources, uh, and how does information travel, to what extent people are using mobile phones, and how are they using it, uh, and certainly the impact that uh, 
international broadcasting has in terms of uh, news and information that they received. Uh, in addition, we focused on, uh, as part of the qualitative effort, focused on uh, how people received the information regarding specific events uh, with respect to the self-immolation as well as the, uh, the election results in 2011. Uh, and got some reaction in terms of how the information was uh, obtained, how they shared it, who they shared it with, and so forth. Given the small uh, sample sizes, a lot of the inferences and the, and the uh, conclusions that I'm going to be drawing are going to be more focused uh, qualitative rather than quantitative in terms of specific numbers. Um, I know that uh, at the end of this, uh, Bill has more information which does add uh, more insights as far as the quantitative aspect is concerned, particularly around word of mouth. Um, as Betsy pointed out, television is the dominant media. People do seem to uh, like uh, watching, uh, and the, the plethora of uh, information that is available and the, uh, the programs that are available perhaps uh, is an indication of uh, why this is not surprising. Uh, we also heard people say, at least in the qualitative sense, that uh, the visual appeal was very important, and, and from that perspective, uh, television seemed to play a very critical role in why people chose that as a, as a popular and dominant media. Um, satellite dishes were obviously more uh, prevalent in um, rural areas. Uh, again, uh, the closer you get to the uh, TAR, I think because of what Betsy had just talked about, uh, the prevalence of satellite was much lower. Cable was far more prevalent in urban areas. Different channels for different needs. Um, Chinese channels clearly are not seen as uh, trustworthy, at least as far as information news and information is concerned. It's been fairly uh, restrained, constrained to entertainment, uh, as a source of entertainment. Uh, we also looked at um, how uh, um, facile people were with respect to understanding various dialects. There are several dialects, and at least three of them uh, that we explored as part of this research. Uh, there was no single dialect that uniformly had a much higher proportion of people saying that they were comfortable listening and understanding programming in. Uh, it is a bit of a challenge uh, because if, if, there is, uh, if somebody is looking for efficiencies, then certainly uh, it's not going to be possible to just limit all programming to one particular dialect. Uh, Chinese and English broadcasting audience is, of course, uh, fairly limited in terms of people's interest and desire and the ability to understand programming that, those languages. Looking to digital modes of sharing, uh, clearly uh, the focus of this research was on mobile phone use, so the criteria used to select the people already ensured that uh, everybody had access to and were a heavy user of mobile phones. So I'm not even going to start with uh, describing what proportion has a mobile phone and how often they use. But given that as a basis, uh, texting is fairly common. Uh, more than four in 10 said they report, um, I mean, sending and receiving texts on their mobile phones. Um, however, um, when we asked in terms of, you know, what other methods do they use to share news and information, um, web-based instant messaging program as well as SMS-based uh, programs like Kex and Chinchin were popular, uh, were reported to be uh, fairly popular among the uh, younger uh, audience. Uh, particularly in terms of sharing news and information. Uh, but when we probed a bit more in terms of what kind of news and information, it was a bit more varying in terms of whether sensitive information was necessarily being shared using these methods. Um, I think they uh, cited several barriers to this. One is as far as uh, cell phones are considered, uh, there's a new regulation uh, requiring all cell phone users to register their SIM cards so the government can keep track of you know, what messages are being sent and, and so forth. Um, and then, of course, there is a, a fairly heavy amount of web blocking uh, and extensive cafe monitoring happening, so folks don't feel very comfortable being able to do so uh, from a, a cyber cafe and so forth. Um, but where there's a will, there's a way. Individuals do find ways to get around uh, many of these things, and a few things that we heard were people using unregistered SIM cards to get around the registration issues. Uh, other digital medium also being used, uh, transferring information through thumb drives, uh, and VCDs and DVDs. The next point is about who's the information node and uh, uh, why are they successful and how are they successful. Uh, we asked individuals to say if they, if they feel that people in their community would see them as a source of information, news and information. And we found one in five among the people we spoke to saying uh, they did feel like they were seen by their communities as a source of news and information. 
Um, what was more interesting was when we looked at what do these people consume, two thirds of these four uh, individuals who had self-proclaimed to be information nodes were users of international media. So they were getting a lot of information, news and information through, from international media. By definition, most of them were men. I say by definition because about 90% of the people attending the Kala Chakra, in fact, were men. So you know, it, it was inevitable that we would be ending up with more men than women. Uh, a much larger proportion of monks were part of this group. Um, they were uh, very active in disseminating news. Uh, and they were also seen as uh, fairly accurate and unbiased in the information that they shared with individuals. They tend to be more educated than the average population, uh, skilled in the use of technology such as mobile phones and other digital technology. And as, uh, as I just pointed out, more likely to have uh, reported having consumed international media. And the last thing is um, they were most, more than willing to share the information that they had obtained with trusted members within their community. So they formed the bridge between the average person um, and, the, uh, and the information source that was coming through. Uh, and the majority of them, interestingly, uh, actually said that they understood all or most of the newscast in one dialect. So this was, again, an interesting insight there, considering that we had seen earlier that no single dialect really had uniform uh, access across the entire population. Here's a quote from one of the uh, qualitative uh, interviews we had conducted regarding um, you know, where they hear the news uh, and what kind of information that they are you know, talking about. Moving on to mobile phones, um, it was interesting, besides you know, making phone calls and stuff, the single biggest use of mobile phones currently seems to be taking pictures and sharing pictures with others. Um, about two-thirds, over two-thirds, say they have taken a photograph uh, at least uh, once in the last week, uh, or a little more than that. Um, and about four out of ten said they have shared pictures with others. MMS uh, appears to be popular as well, and uh, sending text is clearly out there in terms of about four in ten saying uh, they do that fairly regularly. Um, what was um, not so interesting, or what was not so uh, you know, expected was perhaps the use of mobile phones for other uh, ways of uh, gathering information, such as using apps to access uh, news and information or listening to the radio. Uh, going into it, I think we were expecting a little more uh, in terms of the use of mobile phones for such technology, but the fact that we talked about uh, there are lots of barriers in terms of fear of uh, being found having an app on their phone or having information on their phone which would you know, be... Uh, lead them to trouble is perhaps part of the reason why I think um, we don't see as much use. But there is a huge amount of potential and we feel like it's uh, the mobile phone technology is not being fully tapped into. Moving on to word of mouth, um, word of mouth again even in this study came through as a single dominant source of reliable news and information. Uh, again friends and family and relatives were cited as the number one source, uh, followed by international media, um, and interestingly enough, unprompted, we also heard people talk about um, sharing news and information via VCDs and DVDs, although uh, they claimed that it wasn't happening as frequently as a few years back. Um, there are several reasons why word of mouth seems to be uh, a very important and reliable source of, uh, source of and mode of sharing information. Uh, news is, you know, generally uh, Tibetans are part of several social circles. They do talk about lots of things, particularly around their culture, the political situation, and so forth. Um, and they take pride in sharing that kind of information. And certainly the events in the last few years appear to have galvanized the younger population to keep the flow of information alive. And, and that is definitely one of the reasons why word of mouth you know, remains fairly critical here. Uh, several of the uh, qualitative uh, respondents uh, you know, reported having heard about uh, self-immolations and the election results uh, first from close friends and relatives. And certainly there were a reasonable number of people also who mentioned having heard it through international media, but word of mouth seemed to be the number one source. And finally, in terms of um, the role that international broadcasters have had, at least as part of the sample is concerned, clearly they've had uh, first-hand news about uh, the uh, you know, what the uh, Dalai Lama has been doing, uh, his teachings, his learnings, his, his um, uh, message to the, the, the audience there. 
uh, certainly breaking news about the self-immolation and the election results in April 2001. These are all cited as uh, news and information that they had heard through the international broadcasters. Uh, obviously, there are not as many numbers here in terms to support what this means, but I think this is where uh, Bill can shed some light in terms of uh, what our past research has indicated. I'm um, turning in terms of source material back to the, the uh, uh, larger scale survey that Betsy was using for her presentation um, earlier uh, of about 1,300 uh, travelers who come out of, of, of Tibet. Um, this was a, uh, results I'm showing here uh, are looking at the whole issue of word of mouth, and I, and I thought it would be interesting to uh, convey a little bit more um, granular and quantitative information uh, about the, the sheer scope of the phenomenon uh, so that we can get some sense of what the multiplier effect is uh, when people uh, listen to or watch BBG broadcasts and how widely the information from those broadcasts gets disseminated among larger populations, even if, among those who are not necessarily di directly reached by the broadcasts. Um, in, the, um, in the survey, we ask people who say they have listened to or watched either RFA or VOA uh, whether they've shared the information they've obtained from those sources with others. Uh, and you can see in this chart that roughly 90% uh, of the audience for both stations says yes, uh, I share information from RFA VOA with, uh, with other people uh, in my, my circle. So it's not just the direct audience, but huge, huge uh, uh, amount of sharing with other individuals um, in Tibet. We then took things a step further uh, and asked uh, those who did share information, uh, with how many people uh, do you share? And again, you can get some sense of the magnitude of this phenomenon here. Uh, you can see that actually a quarter of those who share information uh, share it with 50 or more people. Uh, so if uh, VOA, RFA is reaching X percent of the population, do the multiplication and you can see uh, a very, very wide impact uh, of the, uh, the broadcast of, uh, of both services. Uh, two thirds roughly are saying they share the information from the BBG broadcasters with uh, more than 10 people. Uh, how frequently do they share that information? Uh, most of them share it every day or once a week. Uh, so it's not, not just an occasional phenomenon, but pretty often uh, as well. Uh, then we, we went further and asked, um, how do you share the information? Uh, and, and this gets back again to the, uh, the relative importance of, of word of mouth as opposed to other uh, technically oriented uh, forms of information sharing like, uh, like texting or internet and so on. Overwhelmingly, uh, in-person conversation uh, was the uh, was the way that information gets, gets shared, some people talking on the phone, but, but almost nobody, uh, in spite of um, prompting in the questionnaire, uh, mentioned texting, internet, so on. So it's very much uh, literally word of mouth, uh, and typically with close friends, family members, people are somewhat cautious uh, for obvious reasons about who they share information from the front broadcasters with. Uh, we then ask some specific questions uh, about whether the people in the, uh, in the survey had heard about the, uh, the elections held by the, uh, the government in exile uh, while they were in Tibet. 50% said they had, uh, and we went a little further than that uh, and asked where they first heard uh, this information from. And you can see that uh, over 40% said from close friends, which comports um, fairly well with, with the other data about where people are getting information, how they're sharing it. Um, but notice the second category, VCDs and DVDs. Um, this harks back to the point that Rajesh was making earlier uh, about what appears to be a um, uh, important phenomenon uh, of uh, sharing via, via this technology. 13% said they'd first heard um, from uh, one of the BBG broadcasters. Um, again, all these categories get mixed together because of the, the verbal sharing of information um, from the broadcasters uh, and so on. Uh, and finally, um, how many people did you share this story with? Uh, and once again, you can see uh, the enormous magnitude of, of information sharing uh, from the BBG broadcast. These are percentages of people who heard about uh, the election story on either a VOA or RFA uh, and the number of percentage of people, who they, the number of people with whom they shared that, uh, that information. Uh, so uh, you, you, you can see that uh, among those who, um, who do listen to or watch the, the broadcast, there is a tremendous amount of onward uh, transmission of the information, so the impact spills over well beyond the uh, the direct audience uh, for the uh, for the BBG broadcasters. 
let me turn it back now to, uh, to my colleague, Betsy, who's going to uh, leave us with a couple of conclusions from this morning's presentation. Thanks, Bill. OK, um, just a few quick conclusions. I think um, it's clear that uh, television use has been growing rapidly um, inside Tibet um, with a rapid increase in official television, Tibetan language broadcasts. And the attractiveness of this visual medium is very clear in the success of VOA television, where it is accessible. Um, we see a lot of variation by region, with Amdo seemingly quite ahead. And the flip side of that, of course, is a very high level of tight control in Utsang and the mean, Tibet Autonomous Region. Word of mouth, of course, the critical source for Tibetans to receive and share information. Domestic media is valued, but it's simply not trusted for news. Many Tibetans, therefore, consider US broadcasts their only media so source for reliable information inside Tibet. And as Bill highlighted, audiences report sharing that information very widely. There's a real multiplier effect there. Um, of course, direct access to international media is limited by state control, uh, radio jamming, replacement of satellite dishes with dishes that are less able to pick up international broadcasts, and the required registrations for SIM cards and at cafes for the internet, um, to say nothing of internet blocking. However, we see high levels of motivation to get, um, get the information. And information nodes, such as international radio listeners and monks, nuns, and lamas, clearly are playing a key role in spreading information, not only via word of mouth, but increasingly, as you see, using DVDs and other new media, which provide new possibilities for um, sharing news with Tibetans inside Tibet. So thank you very much. Hi, I'm Brad Aaron from the University of Virginia Tibet Center. Um, I'm interested if you guys could talk a little bit about your methodology in particular who was doing the interviews, and how you dealt with the dialectical differences and the challenges that come from that, and where also I'm interested in the settings? Um, I can tell you um, I, that some of that information I'll have to talk to you offline about. However, um, we have interviewers for each dialect of Tibetan, so um, and all of the uh, interviews were done at various locations outside of Tibet, but it is a rather comprehensive um, group of people who have left Tibet. Right here. A wonderful presentation by all of you. Thank you. I'm Tom Dine. I'm former president of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Uh, do you ever? talk to Tibetans in the United States. And I think there's a pretty good flow of information back and forth. I'm not sure, though. But I, there are a lot of folks that I see <laughs> up and down, more than up and down Connecticut Avenue. Well, I would say you have a rather unrepresentative view of the world. But um, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, there are more and more Tibetans who are able to come to the United States and to Europe. Um, but it is still a pretty small group. That said, um, certainly there is a new media, especially, is facilitating a kind of back and forth of information that was impossible, you know, even a half dozen years ago. So you do have uh, Tibetans in Europe, in the United States, who, uh, you know, have communication with folks back home, and that is important too. I don't have the exact numbers of Tibetans in the United States, but I can try and get that. First in the back. Then I think right up, right up front. Po Chung Tsering from the International Campaign for Tibet. I think Dr. Rajesh Srinivasan in his presentation at one point said that uh, a majority of, uh, of the report, uh, reported understanding Amdo dialect as the dominant uh, dialect. So I was wondering whether that's specific to a specific question, or was that a generalized conclusion? Because that is not natural. 
No, <clears throat> uh, I mentioned that in the context of actually information nodes, those who claim to be information nodes, a majority of them said they were able to understand most or all of the information and news that they heard in the Amke dialect. So it was not the, the general sample, but it is a very small subsample of those that the one-fifth of that population who claim to be information nodes seem to be more comfortable in understanding news and information that was in Amke dialect. So, and, and uh, of course, they have greater access as well um, to media. Notice on um, your um, chart number 30. Adam, kindly tell us who you are. Oh, I'm sorry. Adam Powell from the University of Southern California. Um, I noticed on chart 33 on page 17 uh, the uh, intriguing uh, title, Potentially Used with Mobile Phone for News Sharing Remains Untapped. So I'm wondering uh, what plans there would be for uh, tapping that potential. Do you want to? Um, feel that, Betsy? Or I, I well, I mean, I think that uh, all of us are developing our new media abilities and creating a lot more digital content, which um, is eas more easily shared. Um, and I know that others are pushing out our content as well. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Los Angeles, uh, VOA, Tibetan service. Uh, I just want to add a couple of layers of information that, from our learning, if I may. Um, <clears throat> on the dialect issue, VOA, Tibetan service, from the very beginning, has broadcast in what we call standard literary-based Tibetan. Uh, and it's widely understood across all the three regions. Uh, while the numbers show that our television product is most consumed in Amdo, Qinghai area, where dish use is uh, a little more liberal, uh, their comprehension of all of our programming, uh, the numbers show that they comprehend all of our programming. So I think the dialect issue uh, is not as large uh, an issue as it's made out to be, I think. Uh, also, uh, from what our learning of mobile use, and we get pictures from uh, different parts of Tibet of people holding their mobile phones. Uh, you can see our programming on their mobile phones. We also know in areas like Lhasa, uh, people shell out uh, three times the cost of a regular phone to yeah. have iPhones, to have yeah. the ability to uh, consume our programming. Uh, and I think our television, the success of our television, is more than just the uh, visual attractiveness. Uh, our content is very important and relevant, uh, and the production is, uh, is on par with Chinese television, if not better. Um, and also, I want to say, uh, while television dish uh, used in the TAR uh, has been more controlled, and less than in Amdo area and come. Uh, recently, two, three weeks ago, the party secretary of the TAR uh, made a very strong statement and an order uh, to make sure, to ensure that state information has a monopoly and that no images uh, from foreign broadcast, actually he used the word enemy, uh, enters the TAR. And we are the only people who broadcast images into Tibet. Yeah, thank you. There, there's absolutely no doubt that VOA, Kunlung Television, ex is extremely important and, and is being um, shared in many, many ways and accessed in many, many ways. That's certainly true, and we see audience growth in spite of the removal of the satellite dishes. I also think it's important to note for those of you who are not as familiar, of course, as others might be in the room with our research worldwide, in environments like Tibet, where we cannot do the research inside the country, this is true also in places like North Korea and Cuba and, and various other places. We do, obviously, as you've seen represented here, the very best we can in accessing populations who leave the country for the purposes of, obviously, understanding the media environment and then understanding how what we do is playing with the audiences we seek to reach. Um, it's um, a concern of ours, obviously, about how representative anything that we might learn from those who are traveling, who have left the country, might be. But again, it's, it's looking at what's doable. Uh, and uh, in this case, and over many, many years, we've sought systematically uh, to uh, ascertain what's happening inside Tibet by interviewing those who are traveling or those who have left the country. Another question here. 
Thank you. Uh, Todd Stein from the International Campaign for Tibet. And to flow from what you just said, I mean, admittedly, this, uh, the information here is from uh, the, the travelers, the refugees, um, and not from the, the target audiences. So I'm wondering how much um, the, you know, sort of uh, 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 qualitative, um, sorry, quantitative information here goes into those budgetary and program decisions that you make. Because both of these um, services, uh, the, the VOA, Tibetan Radio and TV, and RFA uh, writ large, uh, ha, um, are, um, you know, were, were uh, enacted by Congress for basically to meet foreign policy needs. So, so where, is there a way that you can characterize how much of those budgetary and program decisions are made um, based on, you know, the, the research that you do here and how much is on those sort of um, uh, qualitative and intangible elements of, of reaching, uh, you know, of, of serving U.S. foreign policy goals? Well, let me just say this, that we, we of course, do the research not as an academic exercise. Uh, all of our research is applied. We do it for the purposes of informing strategies and consequent budgetary uh, allocations. Um, you're absolutely right about the important mandates from Congress with respect to Tibetan broadcasting, with the, which the Board of Governors uh, fully supports. Um, it is critically important, as in this case, to again, discern what's happening to the best of our ability inside a place like Tibet so that we can direct our efforts most successfully. And as you can tell, the one big takeaway, of course, from this is the critical importance of the information nodes, the people who are sharing. And it's extraordinary the extent to which the sharing is happening in the numbers, as you've seen in the slides, of people that a single person may reach out to to communicate with. And I would emphasize that as we assess our performance as well, not just drive strategy on the front end, but assess how we're doing on the back end. We look at impact as a question that is not at all only about numbers, which we can't get accurately in this instance anyway because we can't do nationally representative surveys inside Tibet. But what we can do is say, even if relatively speaking, relative to word of mouth, reliance on international media is low or lower, as you've seen in the information, the fact that that information is being spread, the word of mouth phenomenon, we then look at what we do as essentially priming the pump for the flows of information that can course through what are traditional social networks in a country like Tibet, people talking to one another through communities and so forth. And that is an essential activity, which we have to do in every way we possibly can with all the limitations that you've seen with regard to the restrictions inside Tibet on access to media, language issues, technology differences, and all those things. Um, so it's, it's that contribution of research to informing how we go about doing what we do that's, that's so important. Um, and, and again, it, the, the priority of Tibet, separate and apart from how we do what we do, uh, is it is very high for our broadcasting worldwide. Yeah, I, I, I was going to talk about Please, the if you experience want to of the Yeah, go ahead, Bessie. I, we're joined by Tom Dine, who was the former head of Radio for Europe, and I was talking to him before about um, how much uh, the Radio for Europe research effort was helpful in getting our research effort up and up and running. And one of the things that one of the things that Radio for Europe did was after the um, breakup of the Soviet Union, they went back to find out how accurate their traveler um, studies had been, you know, over the years, which had been used to project audiences and learn about their audiences. And the takeaway from that was that it actually, if you looked at people from similar demographic segments, as the travelers who remained back in the Soviet Union, they were actually quite accurate in um, reflecting what was going on inside the Soviet Union among that demographic. So I, I, that's been something that I have found quite interesting as we do these type surveys. Joan Dine, affiliated with the Tibetan Poverty Alleviation Fund micro-enterprise supporting effort. Um, having been in touch with a Chinese dissident um, on environmental um, issues, 
who spends full time evading Chinese censorship as part of his mission. And he says that 16 million people receive his tweets mm. across China. And I was wondering to what extent you can share what um, efforts in using and developing access to tweeting, what problems and challenges and potential you see. Um, I, I think maybe I should turn it over to the, from Radio Free Asia, I see our president is back in the back there and may have a few things she- Yes, Libby Liu is the president of Radio Free Asia. So you're, um, to clarify your question, it's that um, the tweeting is extremely effective in the Mandarin language, and you're wondering what the approach is for using that in Tibetan? Oh, the que I think... Yeah. Problem. How, can, how, can, how do you see... I think that um, the first hurdle um, with the Tibetans inside Tibet is the um, behavioral usages. And um, what we find is that the most effective way to get communication in closed societies, especially difficult and illegal means of communications, is to build into the society the habit of doing things like texting, etc. cetera. So, um, Based on the information that we have currently, texting is not a very big um, behavioral usage by Tibetans in Tibet. However, um, we know that that can change very quickly. And it can change quickly um, due to the ease of use and um, based on the relevancy of the content. So um, yes, I think that's going to be a big piece of the future and um, something we're working on. Thank you, Libby. We've exhausted our hour, and I promised that we would start and stop on time. So I want to I want to close uh, with a couple of just quick notes. Uh, first of all, to thank you all for coming very much. We appreciate your being here. As you can see, this research briefing on Tibet is part of a series. Last month, we started the series with Iran. The upcoming briefings will be next month on the 16th of August on Nigeria, and then following in September on the 20th on Burma. We welcome you to come uh, to those briefings as well. Thank you for coming today. One final note that I want to mention to you about how we assess impact, just for your broader understanding of uh, our look at our services. Uh, it is the case, of course, that in the broadcasting we're doing to Tibet, we're targeting people inside the country. And this research is, is, is to enable our fuller understanding of how best to go about doing that. At the same time, uh, our broadcasting services at The Voice of America and at Radio Free Asia are sourcing news inside Tibet. They're breaking news almost every day on Tibet. And what happens in a world of viral news distribution is that that information, once it gets into English, is then shared widely across the internet. It's picked up by leading media outlets all over the world. One of our ambitions as a news organization, of course, is in the areas that we cover, to drive the news agenda. You have to have original reporting to do that. We have that reporting, and it's another indicator of impact for us, the extent to which the information that we're getting outside of Tibet, and more broadly around Tibet, in the region and the world, is informing the global discussion about Tibet. So I just leave you on that note that that's another indicator of impact that goes beyond the research that we do. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.